Welcome to the Coaching Revealed podcast series on leadership coaching. I'm one of the podcast hosts, Emily Tarani. In today's episode, IOC Executive Director Dr. Jeffrey Hull sits down with IOC founder Dr. Carol Kaufman. Not only is Carol a renowned psychologist, but she is also a trailblazer who played a pivotal role in shaping the coaching profession from its early days. In this engaging episode, we unraveled the fascinating layers of Dr. Kaufman's career from her roots as a trauma specialist to becoming a world-renowned leadership coach. We discussed the intersections of trauma and peak performance, delving into the profound ways coaching can guide individuals through both healing and optimal living. We uncovered the transformative power of coaching in high-stakes situations. We discussed Dr. Kaufman's latest venture, a groundbreaking book co-authored with David Noble titled Real-Time Leadership, which unpacks the MOVE model, Mindful, Options, Vantage Point, and Engage. To wrap up the episode, we shift our focus to the future of coaching, emphasizing the irreplaceable role of the human connection in facilitating transformative change. Jeff and Carol explore how coaching is becoming increasingly strategic for organizations and evolving into a pervasive force in various facets of life. So join us for an enlightening conversation with Dr. Carol Kaufman, where we uncover the past, present, and future of coaching and gain valuable insights into the intricate world of leadership development. Thank you for tuning in to Coaching Revealed. Let's get started. Well, hello, everyone, and welcome to Coaching Revealed, podcast from the Institute of Coaching. I am super excited to be here. I am Jeffrey Hull, the Executive Director of the Institute of Coaching, and we are kicking off a wonderful new series of podcasts with the Institute and starting with leadership coaching. But we're really going to start with someone very, very special who is here with me today. Her name is Carol Kaufman. And uh, many of you who are listening right now will be familiar with Carol. You have known her and her work with the Institute of Coaching as one of the co-founders of the Institute of Coaching. And she has a wonderful new book out called Real-Time Leadership. She's also the author of a professional development program called Leader as Coach, which won Harvard's inaugural <laughs> award for a cultural culture of excellence in mentoring that's been rolled out across the United States. And she was the founding editor, uh, editor-in-chief of Coaching, an international journal of theory, research, and practice, which was the first peer-reviewed coaching journal published by a major publishing house. So hello, my dear. Great to see you. This is so much fun. Let's start with going back to the beginning a little bit. Um, you know, you're a psychologist. You worked at McLean as, and you're still an assistant professor there. How did it all unfold for you from the days of being a therapist to the days of being a coach? Well, it all started out because I procrastinate. <laughs> what happened was it was one year, it was 2000 and two or three, and I needed my continuing education credits for um, psychology. And it was like, I had a deadline. So I like ran around looking for what's a workshop I could take. And there was a workshop being given by Ben Dean uh, for mentor coach. It was a coaching workshop. And um, two things happened. Ben is very calm, but hilarious. And said after five minutes, you've seen my entire emotional range. So um, to keep you in the room, someone here is going to win coaching, but you have to be here to get it. That, I thought that was like hilarious. And anyway, there was a follow-up call. And so I won coach tuition. And without that, I'm not sure it would have happened. I started out as a, a clinical psychologist and um, specialized in trauma and was a, basically was a trauma specialist for, for a long time. And the thing with trauma, I love that work. People are recovering from something that happened to them out over time that my clients were both trauma survivors and peak performance. And in any session, it might be part of the time sobbing about some deep injury. And then the other part of the time talking about the politics of managing a one woman show at the MFA. It, it sort of segued over to a peak performance practice. And I thought that was coaching. I started taking an actual coaching course. And I mean, I just did it because I'd won it. It was like a near miss car accident. I think if I hadn't found this, because it's very different from being 
the the in the expert position helping you become a peak performance manage your body manage your politics etc and i had a whole peak performance model to the whole idea of coaching for peak performance which is very different it helps to be informed by all we know as psychologists but much more pulling from the other person and so that was a radical shift for me that's so interesting because as i was listening to you and this is something i've never heard from you before, but it makes perfect sense that you are now, however many years later, coaching at the C-suite, a lot of the time CEOs. And you just spoke about the early days where folks with trauma were often the high performers. Yeah. And so it makes perfect sense that your trauma-informed psychological background helps you understand some of the craziness that goes on at the top of the house and have a way of listening into it and have a compassion and empathy and also a way of helping them transform, like leverage it to high performance that traces all the way back to your roots. Yes. You know, for many years, I worked with the Authentic Leadership Institute. I think it's it's now called Core Leadership. And we did a six-year program at Unilever. The top, it turned out to be the top 300 or so. One of the things we did, we worked with Bill George from Harvard Business School. He does the whole thing about uh, crucibles. It's really fascinating. Like at, people sort of ask as a, as a coach, how do you deal with, with trauma? Um, you know, we say the difference between sort of therapy and coaching is that in therapy, you follow the trail of tears to healing. And in coaching, you follow the trail of dreams to get to the optimal life. Now, in therapy, um, optimal life and peak performance can come from it. And in coaching, deep healing can come from it. But your, your intentions and your pathways are different. And Bill George talks about crucible moments and having people explore what are the toughest experiences you've ever had. And in meeting after meeting after meeting with these 300 leaders, the far majority had some serious um trauma in their lives that that they had overcome. And what you do as a coach in that situation is really say, okay, so X happened to you. You explore how has that made you a better leader? And you and you have that frame in what meaning does this have? And it's a very different slant, but in doing that work, it has been helpful to know. And even as you think of coaching versus therapy, um, even though I could do psychotherapy, I really stay in the area of, you know, first profound empathy, but then really experiencing how that has strengthened you and given you like a real backbone. Or as I say, it's not a club you want to join, but if you're in that club, you're stronger than the average bear. Inherent resilience, basically, because you survived. Post-traumatic growth has become incredibly popular, interesting to coaches. There's a lot of good research, but you were doing that all the way back even before coaching was really so-called profession. I'm curious if you look back on, was there a moment for you personally when you just recognized that this was going to be a career change or a profession or that coaching was going to be real and taken seriously? The coaching being real and taking seriously is a second conversation, but the reason you know me and the reason, frankly, that anyone watching this knows me goes back to three words. And here's what happened. So I went to the men mentor coach and, um, and, and as I said, one person was going to win and there was like 35, 36 people on the follow-up call and one of them was going to win free coaching tuition. So that was on a Sunday and Monday during the day, I suddenly had this very strong sense of Carol, you've won the coaching, to which my immediate reaction was, oh, great. Now I'm going to be really unhappy when I don't win it. And then the email <laughs> came and it said one, two, three, or 30 something. And it said two dash the winner. What was very powerful for me was one of these experiences that we have no cognitive matrix for, but I suddenly had this overwhelming sense of this is important. Never in a thousand years could I ever have imagined how different my life would become. But I just had this sort of feeling. And um, I have a short attention span, but I decided, okay, um, this is important. So I took my, um, my little oak chair from my 
from my roll top desk, moved it over, faced the wall. And I sat down to meditate and said to myself, if there's a life lesson here, I want to know what it is. And so I was quiet for a while. And then the words surfaced, don't hold back. Um, what does that mean? Okay, so then it's Wednesday and I'm reading, I think it was the American Psychologist, an article by a former president. And I'm reading the article and thinking, oh, wow, this is really interesting. I'd like love to talk to him. And then like any normal person, my next thought is, yeah, right. right. And then the next thought was, don't hold back. And I realized it meant that whenever I thought of something, I had to do it was a reason not to. Now, sidebar to that is people think I did a lot of things out of confidence, but that's not true. I did it because I had this inner mandate that I was not allowed to hold back. And I had the thought of, I want to call this person, but I didn't, by the way, um, but I did email. And I did not know at that time that this person's extremely good with email. And I heard back. Marty and I then met at the Gallup organization. We wound up, um, we wound up traveling the world together. I wound up hosting his birthday party for seven or eight years because it happened during the American Psychological Association meeting. He, you know, referred people to me, advised me regularly. Um, and it was a very, you know, from don't hold back. Okay, that's path one. And for just just to mention, for those folks that may not know, uh, uh, yeah. listening, Marty Seligman, I mean, he's really known as the father of positive psychology, fundamentally uh, a, a turning point, really, from looking at pathology to looking at happiness flourishing and what can work in people's lives, which has definitely informed all of us as coaches over the years. It's, um, I wrote an article once called um, Science at the Heart of Coaching, which is all about positive psychology. Okay, but that's stream one. Stream two, don't hold back. I was then um, at, at a meeting and, and someone um, had just come back from speaking at the um, International Coach Federation. So ICF, it's 2003, I think. And I remember thinking, oh, I'd like to present at the I at ICF. Okay, and that again, next thought, like you must be crazy, but I actually said this out loud. And the coaching leader who was listening to me looked at me and went, you, you wanna speak at ICF? Carol, that's a long shot. Well, I was then possessed, of course, with this and, and there was nothing that was gonna stop me. So I then um, wound up presenting um, uh, ironically, it was a talk called Pivot Points, Small Choices That Change Your Life, not knowing that this talk would change my life. And I noticed this, um, this woman in the front row, and for Star Trek fans who remember Voyager, she looked just like a tiny seven of nine, um, and who's this you know, beautiful athletic blonde. And after the talk, this woman came up to me, and her name is Margaret Moore. We discovered we both lived in Massachusetts, et cetera, et cetera. And um, we wound up working on a project together. The Institute is really her fault. She said, Carol, coaching needs an academic home and you need to do it. And I'm like, no. Then six months later, Carol, coaching needs an academic home. And I'm like, no. Third time, um, Carol, coaching needs an academic home. And I went, okay, fine. But I'm going to help create the Institute I want, not the Institute you want. Because I was interested in positive psychology and leadership coaching. And she envisioned it as a health and wellness. So we put it together. That's how that happened. Freeze back. There I am, ICF. Then I'm, I'm, I'm talking. And then this woman comes up to me, absolutely beautiful, you know, cheekbones, magical voice. She says to me, first words, why aren't you the face of coaching? I say, I've only been a coach for three months. She goes, that's irrelevant. <laughs> You have world-class material and you need to be the face of coaching. But what did she say? If you want to make it on the, oh, she goes, but you're not ready for the world-class stage yet. And then she was a media coach and she started giving me like, you know, she says, I have some feedback for you. It's not for the faint of heart. And, and it was not, and it was brilliant. And then she says, I feel called to be your coach. And then, um, you know, her name was Ruth Ann. I had no idea who she was. So then I go back to friends I'm there and someone goes, who was that? Do you know who do you, do you know who was talking to you? I'm like, your name's Ruth Ann. She goes, you don't know who she is? I'm like, no. She goes, 
she's a billionaire philanthropist, Carol, and she's been looking for a protege. And I tried to convince her it was me and it's not, but it's you. <laughs> you are made in the shade. Um, anyway, Ruth Ann coached me for a year and then our various projects. And I didn't realize I was being sort of hazed, uh, turning me into a leader. And first she gave me a $20,000 project, then 150, and then a $300,000 project, all, all of which I did. And then at some point she was looking to move on. She had started something called the foundation for coaching. Cause mm. it was really the, the, it was her, really her brainchild because way back when, when this was the wild West, nobody really other than Ruth Ann realized this profession needs academic uh, basis. And she started funding coaching research. And then she donated all of that to, um, to us. So that's how it started. Don't hold back. Mm. I want to jump 20 years, whatever number of years, right up till now, um, and use our last time together to talk a little bit about the new book that came out and also to get your reflections on where you see the field going, because, mm. you know, that arc is not finished by any means. It's still alive and moving and changing every day. So I was working with David Noble. Um, he was a very interesting guy. He was the CEO of the world's first digital bank, managing uh, partner at um, two different strategy firms. Before that, a banker and, um, and then coach. And he and I were working together at, at Egon Zender, doing a lot of training together. And then we started coaching together where I was working with the CEO. He was working with the team. I was in the CEO offices. He walked by. I said, oh, you have to meet so-and-so. He then was asking very different questions. So we were really thinking about putting together all the frameworks that we knew. David wound up clumping them. We, we sort of had them clumped together, but he really came up with this acronym of MOVE, M-O-V-E, for people to be mindfully alert, you know, mindfully know, but alert like an athlete to the three dimensions of leadership. What do I need to do? Who I need to be? How I need to relate to connect to and work through others? Then to be an options generator, which is an HBR article also in January, how to develop four ways forward, something we call way power, which is based on the work of Shane Lopez and Rick Snyder, how to validate your vantage point and sort of make sure you're seeing what you're seeing and E to engage in effect change. Now, one of the things the book is really good for is um, for those of you who have clients who are very skeptical of coaching because we don't make the case for coaching at all. It is, you know, they say in writing, like show, don't tell, jump right into a coaching session, high stakes situation with a guy who was about to be CEO and had just blown it. And then we go from there. But the thing is, the core of it is really from a quote from Viktor Frankl, who survived four concentration camps, where he says between every stimulus and response, there's a space. And in that space is our freedom. That is actually what real-time leadership is about, is how you develop that kind of flexibility. And that's been very exciting. The leaders love it. And it is a good resource. It's it's like an operating manual. We really go down and Harvard um, has asked us to do a workbook. But the way it happened, just in a nutshell, so David really pushed this. He wanted to do the book. I kind of wanted to do the book, but wanted to do something else as well. So we had a conversation, which I thought was a conversation about finding a ghostwriter. So I'm having a conversation with someone who was referred to me who would really help find us a ghostwriter because I, I didn't want to write the whole book. And at that point, I didn't know David was a better writer than me, which was humbling. Um, so we're talking to the guy and we're telling him the idea and we send him this outline and this and that. <clears throat> and then it turns out that actually we'd been sent to him under false pretenses. He wasn't someone to help us with a ghostwriter. He was a senior editor at HBR. I'm like, a little humiliated because I'm like, oh, well, listen, I understand it's too early to talk to you. We don't have our table of contents, our market analysis, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, what? You don't have your ideas? I'm like, yeah, no, we do. Uh, you don't think you have the capacity to do it? Well, well, I think we need a ghostwriter. But yeah, he goes, I don't think you need a ghostwriter. And um, I like it. And I'm going to present it to the murder board on Tuesday. And I shouldn't call it a murder board. Um, <laughs> yeah, because they didn't kill it. <laughs> right, that's right. So literally a 20 minute conversation. So again, it is really like, although I am on a reluctant atheist, it really does feel like my work and all, all these things that have happened. It's like the universe wants coaching. I think we make offers also, not just as questions, 
but then flip those back into pulling from people. And I do think, I think it's the, the most powerful change management kind of orientation. And I think where the field is going is almost that, that coaching is becoming liquid. It's just water flowing downhill, you know, basically coaching, you know, being at the top of the house, being in your house, being in the schools, physicians, nurses, healthcare, the work Margaret's doing on getting Blue Cross Blue Shield codes, et cetera. So I think that's it. There's the profession of coaching, and then there is the skill and act of coaching and coaching weaving its way into the consciousness of people the way that positive psychology did. Positive psychology was one mainstream thing, and now it really informs a lot of psychology as a whole. So that's my guess. And also it's becoming more strategic. It's more becoming a strategic tool for organizations. So that's my guess on where it's going. Yeah, no, what a wonderful story. I mean, I knew some pieces of that since I know both you and David personally, but I didn't know the whole evolution of how it all unfolded. So that's really fascinating. I have to say that what I love about your book is um, that when I work with senior clients, it doesn't even have to be C-suite. I mean, it can be startups. It can be, you know, the next generation. It's not, it's not a requirement that it's a CEO, but we all often get into this theme of mindfulness. Mm -hmm. And what I love about your move model and the pragmatism involved is that it sort of helps my clients understand the usefulness of mindfulness, because you can give them John Kabat-Zinn, you can give them a lot of other wonderful reading and talk about sit and watch your breath and sit still and take a moment, whatever it is, right? And on one level, they all appreciate that. I mean, I have done mindfulness workshops, like with investment bankers and you know, they, they loved it. They get it. They're not, they're smart people. They understand that if you stop, breathe, reflect and ground, you're going to have a much better likelihood of not doing something crazy. Right. So yeah. all of that, all of that makes sense. But what you did in your book with David is you created a framework that allows action to follow from mindfulness, which I really appreciate, right. like a, the vantage point, the engagement, which all comes from a mindfulness space. Yeah. And that's why I added the alert. David is a, is very good at mindfulness. I'm, I'm not, by the way, I try, um, but for me, it's uh, one person said it was sort of meditation in fast paced motion. Walk into a room and you just go quick. What do I really need to do? Half a second of mindfulness can change the outcome. Who do I want to be right now? Okay, that's just, you know, again, because I say, how do you change in no extra time? Right. So it's sort of the, the larger philosophy and mindset of, you know, creating a space. But it's also how do you do it under high stakes situations fast? But it was only after I finished the book and couldn't claw it back that I realized we'd also written a parenting book. You could read the whole thing from the perspective of parenting, how to be mindfully alert. You walk in. I remember one time my son, I walk in, my son has this unholy mess on the table and goes, mom, can I watch TV now? And so then I went through the MOV model, um, basically, which is, okay, what do I really need to do? So you can say, let's just get the homework done. Well, is it? Or does it have to do with discipline? Does it have to do with love of learning? You know, what? And who do I want to be right now? Have I done enough emotional regulation on myself that my head just doesn't explode when I see this unholy mess yet again and I want to watch TV, right? And then can I be mindful and then think, how do I need to relate right now? And what are my choices? So it all can go with parenting. And in this case, we have these four stances, lean in, engage, lean back, think, lean with nurture and the capacity to not lean at all and reflect, which I actually did, which is unusual. And then just that split second of, of mindfulness, the question came to me, which I then asked him, which is, um, I said, Michael, um, look at your homework. And if you were proud of your work, go watch TV. And I left the room, you know, so it's like, who do I want to be now? One of the CEOs yeah. asked herself that question. And realize, wait, the least important meeting of my day is the most important meeting of theirs. So the split second mindful. In the last few minutes we have together, let's talk about the future of coaching. Um, I think folks would love to get your perspective on 
you know, where is artificial intelligence going to fit into this? I don't think anyone thinks we're going to get replaced anytime soon by robots or bots, but we are being taken seriously as a amazingly successful transformational tool. And it's being mm-hmm. scaled by many organizations, not just mm-hmm. at the top. Yeah. So that's the good thing. But they're also looking to save money by automating and by bringing in artificial intelligence. And so what are your thoughts as you project, as Marty Sullivan would say, prospection out five years, 10 years of the profession? And what should we be thinking about as coaches? Well, I do think that sort of basic, some of the basic questions, I think an AI program to do quite well. You know, Jeff, what do you want to work on? Right. Okay. What's the deeper challenge of that? What's the deeper challenge of that? What do you want to do with that? Okay. You you can do that. But one thing we know is that one of the things that's so powerful in coaching is the relationship. And mm-hmm. AI cannot deliver a relationship. And we also know that a lot of change is essentially the neurological interaction when you are with someone who deeply believes in you that evokes something in you. And AI cannot do that. It can deliver content, it can drip out content, and it can be an incredibly useful support of coaching. And then um, Beth Porter has done some fascinating work. She's based at MIT, and I cannot remember the name of it at the moment, but they use sort of AI and team coaching. The AI program goes on like say during a Zoom call or something, And it can remind you, say your goal is, I don't want to talk so much. So a little thing then come up to say, you are now talking 35% of the time. You know, there's eight people, that's too high. Okay, that's good informational feedback. But again, for for change to happen, you, you need something deeper in that. So it'll help you identify them and set up programs for them. And I don't know that we have the data yet to find out how well it works. But back to David Peterson. David Peterson used to say, it's not that hard to be a good coach. It's very hard to be a great coach. When you get into questions uh, that are, I mean, you've also said this too, when you get to my mind to the key question of who do you want to be, I think it's really more about identity. And identity gets, gets developed and manifested through relationship, yes. right? Just as you said, you don't really know the story because identity is a story. It's a narrative of who you think you are, who you mm-hmm. think you are, who you see yourself. But until you have a mirror, you could live in, you can be in la la land. And a lot of leaders are in la la land. And that's where coaches are so, if they're willing and able and engaged, they're so profoundly impactful because it's like, you think you're doing what? You think you're, you think you show up as what? Well, you know, let's talk about how you really show up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Here's and I don't see a bot taking that role anytime soon. So, I, a bot uh, AI really can't work. I, I think at the top of the house, or even with really with high performers. Um, and a, a a lot of our work for real time leadership is very good for you know MBA pre MBA right. in terms of developing a leadership identity. So well, that's a great segue to what will maybe be my last question, because we could keep talking for hours, but we do need to let you go. It, for those coaches that are listening to this that are no, not yet at the top of the house, and many mm-hmm. may aspire to get there, what would you give? I know you're not an advice giver, because that's not coaching, but there's moments when it's worthwhile. What advice would you give them? I'm not opposed to advice at all. I'm not opposed to offering or teaching at all. I am a bit opposed to a coach actually telling someone what to do as an offer. Um, But here are some of the things. Um, One, the biggest enemy to being a CEO coach is ego, which is if you walk in that room or on that call with a a sense that you have to prove something, Mm. you're at grace already. Um, You have to kind of be in the headset of this is right, it will happen. If it's not right, I can't make it happen. And we sort of say the big skill in a leadership coach is, would you be comfortable hanging out in the airport lounge with a CEO? If not, figure out what it is that gets in the way of that and help with your ego. The other thing is you start out doing anything anybody asks you. And if you want to experience with leaders, go into the nonprofit world 
and offer something pro bono or super low bono to just, you know, um, get, get yourself through your paces. For me, I think the best leadership training I got was when I was just signed on at first as just one of a panel of coaches to work at Unilever and which led to, you know, sort of six um, years of massive immersion. Mm -hmm. So the thing is, don't be too proud or whatever to do anything and think in terms of probabilities. What will increase the likelihood of you getting into a place of coaching more senior leaders? The other thing I've encouraged people to do is go out and find baby founders who has founded a teeny organization. They don't have money, you know, and and coach them and get the experience that way. I love that because you know what you're what you're all of what you just said reminds me of me. Yeah. <laughs> and today, however many years later, I do a lot of C-suite coaching. And, yeah. you know, exactly what you're pointing to was two key things for me. I look back on, I never aspired to be where I am now. It wasn't in my mind. It was more, yeah. I met these two brilliant, incredibly wonderful women, and I want to hang out with them. And that's what you're saying. It's like, say yes. One thing leads to another. I mean, just say yes and grow with. Wow. Well, I'm so honored that you are our first guest for our new podcast, Thank you. Uh, Coaching Revealed. And hopefully we have revealed to our listeners uh, some of the background of you as an individual and of how coach the coaching profession evolved. I want to encourage everyone to go out and get a copy of this book, because if you want to work at the top of the house, this is a wonderful tool to put to use. So tell us the best place for them to find it and how they can find you. Okay. Well, if you know how to spell my name, <laughs> Kaufman, two Fs, one N, you can go to carolkaufman.com, which can lead you to me. It can lead to the book. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you very, very much. Yeah, I am sure it has been. And I think everyone that's going to come away from listening to this, wherever they are in their coaching journey, should be inspired by your um, incredible gift to this, what became a real profession over time and continues to be. So one of the, I read in Forbes the other day is one of the fastest growing professions in the world. Mm -hmm. So, so thank you so much for taking the time to kick us off and uh, we'll look to see you again soon. Thank you for listening to this episode of Coaching Revealed brought to you by the Institute of Coaching. You can learn more about the Institute on our website at instituteofcoaching.org. You can stay up to date with new episodes of our podcast by liking and following Coaching Revealed. You can also find us on social media on LinkedIn, Instagram, and X with the handle Institute of Coaching. We also love hearing from our guests, so please reach out to us with thoughts you have on this episode and any questions you have about coaching. Until next time, this is Emily Tarani with Coaching Revealed.